Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind, conversations on leadership, coaching, and team building. Your host, Terry Pettit, led the University of Nebraska Cornhusker volleyball team from 1977 to 1999 and coached Nebraska's first ever national championship in 1995. Today, Coach Pettit mentors coaches, authors books, and presents to corporations and businesses on leadership and team building. I'm Dave Young, producer of the podcast. Thanks for joining us. And now, here's Coach Terry Pettit. Hello, this is Terry Pettit, the host of Inside the Coaching Mind, and I'm joined by our producer, David Young, who's in Austin, Texas. I'm in Tucson, Arizona, and our guest today is in Tucson, Arizona. Our guest is Gwen Pell Egbert. If you've coached volleyball in Nebraska, if you've played volleyball in Nebraska, either as a a uh, high school coach or a club coach, then you're well aware of Gwen Pell Egbert. And if you're a college coach who's recruited in Nebraska, you know Gwen Pell Egbert. Good morning, Gwen. How are you? Morning. I'm good, Terry. Good. And you're in Tucson, Arizona, because this year, after all that you've done in volleyball and wearing various hats, this year you're a volunteer coach. Uh, to Dave Rubio, the head coach of the University of Arizona Wildcats. Following uh, graduation at Nebraska, you uh, were a high school coach for many years at Papayan La Vista and Papayan La Vista South, where you won six state championships. You and Jake Moore founded uh, Nebraska Juniors. Um, This is an interesting uh, trivia point. You may be one of the few coaches in the country who has coached two women who went on to be captain of the U.S. Olympic team, Allison Weston and uh, uh, Jordan Larson. Uh, Following your high school career, you uh, uh, went to Doan College, an NAIA school. You coached there. Last year, you were a volunteer coach at uh, uh, Indiana University. Um, Why are you doing this? What? Tell us how you ended up in Tucson. Well, um, I ended up in Tucson because I've been doing camps for Dave Rubio for, I don't know, probably the last, well, since I was at Doan University. Um, One of my good friends, Greg Whitus, has been the assistant there, and it's a chance for us to get together and catch up, and I can do camp there. And um, when I was at camp, you know, Dave was like, hey, you know, when you're done, you should come be a volunteer. And I was like, that's a great idea. I would love that. Um, And I wouldn't have to do any recruiting, which is not fun (laughs) for me. I didn't like the recruiting part of the college coaching. I just show up to practice and help kids, which is what I love. And and what's your role? Specifically, what players are you working with the most? Well, I work the most right now. Currently, I'm working a lot with the setters. And then... um, we kind of changed halfway through the season. The first half, I was working with the defensive specialist players. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I good. work with all the. But we work with all the players in practice. We kind of all give guidance to whoever needs it. And right now, Arizona has a young team. You finished over five hundred, but you're waiting for a bid to the uh, NIT, which should come out on on Monday, and you'll likely host. That's going to be exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, never, never participated in a postseason <laughs> tournament at the Division One level, so uh, it'd be cool for me. So, and the previous year, you were a volunteer coach at Indiana University to um, Steve Aird. Yep. What was your role uh, at Indiana? My role at Indiana was um, we. Had, it's a different situation than at Arizona in that we had our own facility. So we could use the facility whenever we wanted. So my role was any player that wanted individual help, I was there for them. And we'd had that every day. Uh, I worked a lot, again, with the setters. I worked with the outside hitters. I worked with every position there because every we were really young there, too, and they all wanted help. So I would be with middles. Like, we would have three, four hours in the morning of individuals. Wow. Yeah. And then a lot of times they were in early for serving or passing and I would be there for that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It so was. I'm assuming you in, in both situations, you traveled with the team uh, and you were 
at home, both home and away matches. What um, c- compare what you've seen in the Big Ten um, and what you've seen in the Pac-12? How do the what's similar with the conferences? What's different? Are the cultures similar? Well, first of all, the travel is completely different in the Pac-12 versus the Big Ten. In the Big Ten, we chartered. And chartering is a big, big, big advantage. In the Pac-12, everybody does commercial. So you spend a lot of time in airports. A lot of, we had one really bad trip where our flight got canceled. So that we almost had to cancel a match because of it. Um, so that's a big difference in just how the ki- how fresh the kids are, you know, how early they get back. So that's one huge difference there. Um, the play that the the play in the in the Big Ten versus the Pac-12, uh, the Pac-12, you know, the kids are still big and physical, just like in the Big Ten, but the styles are different, completely different. Like in the this is probably not a lot of people will understand this, but in the big 10, there's a lot of reverse the flow. So like if the ball is passed to the left of center, they're going to set the ball back to a person in the back row or a person in the front row. Um, If the ball is way to the right of center, they're going to push the ball out to left front. And in the pac 12, it's more with the flow. There's not a lot of reversing the flow. Hmm. Um, Sometimes things like that evolve because of a dominant program and how they were successful in a conference and then other teams um, go in that direction. Uh, Any difference in in coaching philosophies or uh, strategies that you sense between the two conferences? Not not really. I mean, there's there's more coaches in the Big Ten that have been there longer, so they are definitely ingrained in what they do. Um, the coaches in the Pac-12 are, are, they're a younger group. Um, a lot of them are new to coaching or they've been an assistant and they've moved up. So they're, they're using some parts of the person that they worked for and some parts of the person that they, uh, played for. So -hmm. there's a mixture in there and they're still trying to work it out. Um, that, that's the biggest difference that I see, uh, just when they're calling timeouts, who they're playing, how they're subbing is different with a, in a younger conference versus a conference that's older. Right. Right. Yeah. I want to give some context, Gwen, to your background. You, you grew up near um, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, you chose to go to Kellogg Community College at a time when you could have gone to the University of Michigan or Michigan State. And uh, when people hear that, they they're probably shocked that someone would make that decision. <laughs> but but at the time, Kellogg Community College was a stronger volleyball program, wasn't it? Uh, very much so. Um, those schools were absolutely, they were not good. Um, <laughs> they were not good. I could not bring myself to go to a place where my junior college team had just beat them really bad every time we played it. Like we had never lost to any of those schools. So, and, and, and Kellogg had won national championships for some time. They won the two years that you were there. You were a setter. And I'm, I'm correct. I think you also played some middle blocker. I, I did a lot of things. I, I set, I middle blocked, I, and I hit outside too. Right. And you were left-handed. And I know at Nebraska, one of your best – best uh, attack opportunities was anytime you got a two ball in, in the middle of the court. You came to Nebraska and I had forgotten how we recruited you until you shared this with me the other day when we had, we had coffee. Uh, our first full-time assistant was Lynn Ludke, who was, who left after two years because she was getting married. And Lynn had played at USC, had played in the, the national team. And at that time, players continued to play after college in USVBA. And tell us the story about how she she uh, had a conversation with you. So we had won, it was my freshman year, we had won the national championship and we got invited uh, several places to go play in the off season. And one of them was up in Canada. It was a big tournament. 
and we we played her team. She was playing with a team of alumni or older women that had already been used up their eligibility. And we played them in the finals and uh, sh- her team beat ours and they had an all tournament team and she was on the all tournament team along with myself and another teammate. And she came up to us and said, you know, I'm the assistant coach of the university of Nebraska and we want to recruit both of you. And my teammate was going to go to Texas at that time. She was a sophomore. And, you know, she said, well, I'm going to go to Texas, but Gwen will be open. And I said, sure, I'd be, I'd love to look at Nebraska. And I didn't think anything of it and went and played my sophomore year. And uh, we had another really good season. I was an All-American again. I was the MVP of the tournament. And you called me, I think, uh, in February to say, hey, you know, Lynn gave me your name and we want to recruit you. Right. And I don't know that I had seen you play. I was basing everything on Lynn's uh, assessment. I trusted if she said somebody could play, uh, we knew they could play. And at that time, we were also looking for a setter. So you came in your first year, you were a setter attacker. Your second year, you're primarily uh, an attacker. I looked at the roster of the of the 1982 team and their their continued involvement in uh, in volleyball. Your teammates, one of the setters was Mary Bicey Byrne, a uh, great setter who went on to be the head coach at South Dakota State and North Carolina State. Sharon Kramer went on to be the head of the uh, downtown YMCA in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Annie Adamzak coached high school volleyball in Minnesota, was an athletic director in Minnesota, and just recently threw out the first pitch at a Minnesota Twins baseball game that was honoring uh, Title IX. Michelle Smith continues to coach. She's a high school coach in, in Nebraska. Kathy Noth played on the U.S. national team was my associate head coach at Nebraska for 10 years, continues to mentor and train setters in Madison, Wisconsin. Karen Dahlgren went on to be National Player of the Year, was the head coach at uh, the University of Kansas. Julie Herman became the head coach at uh, Tennessee, then went on to be one of the first female athletic directors in the country at at Rutgers. Um, That's an amazing group of women who contributed to volleyball in a big way. Um, Yeah, for sure. It it was a fun group. (laughs) And a a very talented group on the court that won, played in and won Nebraska's first NCAA match. Prior to that, we had been in AIAW, uh, and, and which was a tournament where 24 teams came together but we got to host an NCAA event. And any time any, time you get to host an NCAA event, it's exciting, but you need to win it. You need to win it to get fans to come back. And we played a, a very strong uh, Penn State team coached by Russ Rose, uh, who had a, a premier player on the team, Ellen, Ellen Crandall. Do you remember our preparation uh, f- for the match and how important that match was. Yeah, I remember uh, going through the uh, practice that week, and we were all really excited because we hadn't made it the year before. So we all really wanted to win really bad. And I remember you were really nervous about it. And I remember you, I was the captain, and after we were done with our last practice, uh, you had expressed your nervousness with me about it. And I said, don't worry, coach, we got your back. We're going to kick their butt. (laughs) (laughs) Well, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for doing that. But (laughs) um, and and we had we had an experienced team, although we started two middles. Uh, There were freshmen, Andy Adamzak and Sharon Kramer. Um, But it was it was one of those uh, key moments in Nebraska volleyball where if you win that match, People are going to come back, come back the following year and in years to come, went to play the regionals at Purdue against a team that had beaten us pretty soundly in Lincoln, Nebraska earlier in the season. And you made reference to something that only happened one year, but 
that was the year you could block the serve. <laughs> and uh, uh, Purdue would send two, sometimes three players up at the net. And they, they were tall, 6'2", 6'3", maybe uh, Smith might have been 6'4". So when you served a floater, you were you were you had to pretty much had to lob the ball in to keep it from getting blocked. Plus, we had to practice covering the block if the serve hit the block. Uh, it, it was odd, but anyway, we went to Purdue and we played much better. And what what do you remember about that match? I remember that uh, we had prepared really well for it, and it was. Uh, the other thing that was really strange about Purdue, you know, they play in that same facility that we played in. They still play in that place today. Right. Right. And, you know, you had told us that it wouldn't have any basketball lines on it. It was all for a volleyball only facility, which was the first one. And they had a band <laughs> and they were going to have, there was going to be cheerleaders and we didn't have any of that. And we were all kind of excited for that. You know, we, we were like, okay, a band and a volleyball only facility. So we were really pumped for that. So I remember preparing really well. And I, I was mad that we got smoked 3-0. I was the only senior that was on the team. And I was like, you know what? We're not repeating this. So we worked really hard at that because that we got beat pretty good at home. So I knew we weren't, I felt like we weren't going to do that again. I feel like we were going to give them the match. And we were up 2-0. We were. We were smoking them. It was fun. <laughs> the whole match was fun. Yeah, and they it made was, good adjustments. I remember they made some adjustments, and uh, we had to play really, really hard. And it was hard for us to keep that up for, you know, the next three sets because rally score is a lot different than yeah, you know, regular yes. score. Yeah, yeah. Um, regular score. You had the opportunity to come, come back no matter what the score was if you could just continue to side out. Uh, you said something to me I didn't remember. You said you remembered having a, a, a ball on an open net or oh, something. Oh, yeah. Uh, what we were was up that? in the third. I remember we were up in the third, and I had an open net on a two, and I missed it by like three inches. I was so mad. And after we after I blew that, we we, we let them have a couple more points, and they were, got a little more momentum. Um. And once they got it on their side, I mean, they had a good crowd and the band and the cheerleaders. It was hard for us to <laughs> keep that going. I remember the next, the other thing I remember is the next day we were all really sore. I mean, my whole body, I still remember it was really, really sore. And I felt good about that because I, then I knew that I had given everything I could to try and win that match. Yeah. And, and Purdue was a, an exceptional team. I believe we were ranked. 11th in the country, mm -hmm. and they were probably a top four team that year. A couple of years later, we, we did beat them to or, um, go on to um, a Final Four. But it was, uh, it was certainly exciting and an important moment in the development of, um, of volleyball at Nebraska. Then following that, you went on to coach at Papillion La Vista and Papillion La Vista South, and you won three state championships at Papillion La Vista. Key player there was uh, Allison Weston, who, uh, you know, is certainly one of my all-time favorite players. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous sense of humility, could have played any position. Uh, I remember when you first brought her to camp and she was wearing Converse high tops. <laughs> 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 and, and, uh, uh, we talked about uh, both. Uh, our goal for both of us was to persuade her that her future was in volleyball and not all the other sports she she could have played. Talk about Allison a little bit. Um, well, like you, one of my favorites, and I've coached many, many, many wonderful players, and she's still just one of my just just love her. Um, well, she walked in the gym and, you know, I'd only been at Papillion about, you know, two years and, you know, people have been telling me about her and I'm like, whatever, you know, people talk and you don't really believe it. And then she walks in and, you know, I was like, okay, she's got really nice size. And then I watch her move and she moved like so fast laterally and she could jump and she hadn't hardly played volleyball. She just started it. You know, we were fortunate 
at Pavilion, we had a junior high program so they could start in seventh grade. And she was in eighth grade. And we didn't have, at that time, our school was so big, we didn't have ninth graders until their 10th grade year. So, and we couldn't, you couldn't really bring them up. It was really hard to do that uh, at that time. It got easier. So, you know, I watched her and I'm like, you know what, this kid's going to have potential, but I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it. You know, I knew she was there, but I wasn't really thinking about it until she, her sophomore year. And I really, you know, got her every day and had her in camp for two weeks in the summer. And I could see this kid's got potential. She listened uh, and did exactly what you said, right. which is unusual. <laughs> right. Yeah, she was, she was an all-state performer in four sports. She played, I think she oh. might've been a goalie in soccer. She ran track, she played basketball. Um, and, and that was pretty common in Nebraska. Most, I, I think in the years that I coached, I only had one player that was not a multi uh, sport athlete. You were a multi-sport athlete. Mm -hmm. So, so you have this great success there. And then, uh, uh, another Nebraska, former Nebraska player, Enid, uh, Schoenwise, uh, comes to you and says that she'd like you to come with her to Pepe and La Vista South, a new school, um, and coach there. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I would have made that jump. I mean, you were leaving a, a tradition and a, and, a, and a school that had had tremendous success. But you said something to me yesterday. You said it was five years before that school had success in sports. And that's not uncommon for a, a new school. And then we also talked about the importance of athletic administration in that situation in intervening with parents. Talk about the role of an athletic director uh, at a high school institution. Well, the athletic director is a very important part in supporting coaches. Um, I was fortunate at Papillion La Vista South. They knew that I was a green coach. They knew I had not been a head coach before. I had a lot of experience coaching, but not as the head coach. So they, they were very aware of that and knew they were going to have to back me up. Cause I was going to make mistakes, which I did. Um, and I always felt like they had my back. They, any of the problems or any, any parents that were complaining, uh, they intervened and had a meeting or talked to them on the side at a game or whatever. And I didn't feel a lot of pressure about parents there. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing at Queen La Vista South. We had Jeff Johnson as the athletic director, you know, was the principal and Jeff had, uh, a, good experience. I heard great things about him uh, when he was at Grand Island. So I knew this was going to be, you know, a good guy to work for. Uh, he was very prepared for the fact that we were not going to be successful right off. And I, I can tell you it, the hardest part for me was the fact that I'd been so successful. I thought it would just transfer and the kids would just be, Oh, whoa, coach Egbert. Oh, do whatever she says. And it was not that way. It took it. We only got a little better every year. Um, it was it was small and incremental. And then I I got a good group. Uh, my third year in, uh, by the time they about second or third year, I got them in. And by the time they were seniors, we were in the state finals. Right. Uh, because they re they really bought into it, and they got sick of losing. Right. Um, you know, after right. a while, you get sick of losing, and you want to be different, so you change things. I, I want to talk a little bit more about that role of the uh, administrator, whether it's the athletic director or the principal, sometimes the superintendent, running interference with the head coach, backing them up. Do you have a sense that there's less of that today, that co coaches aren't support, supported in, in that way today? Uh, yeah, very real sense of that. Um, it's kind of the opposite uh, back when I started, you know, uh, parents really didn't have much of a say of anything. You know, they could give their opinion, but, you know, it would be, you know, we're going to support our coach. We believe in her. Uh, we trust her. Whereas today, it's more of the opposite. Oh, you, oh, is that happening? Well, tell me more. Whereas back in the day, it would be your kid needs, you know, your player needs to keep working and you need to trust the coach that she's going to do the right thing for the team. 
And now it's, you know, well, tell me more and maybe I can change that. And it really should not be that way. You know, when they get a boss, eventually that boss is probably not going to take kindly to them coming in and telling them how to do their job. Right. Uh, they're going to have to work their way up and bide their time and work really hard and sh show that person who's their boss that they can be a team player. Right. It's And it's even happening at the uh, collegiate level. Oh, yeah. Players are going to the athletic director and the athletic director um, uh, listens and and not only listens sometimes, but uh, kind of undermines the coach to some degree. Uh, I was fortunate. I only had, to my knowledge, one parent went to the athletic director. He went to Bob Devaney and Bob Devaney threw him out of the office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I do remember uh, Bill Byrne was my AD the last 10 years, and uh, the basketball players um, went into his office complaining about the head coach. And I'm not even sure Bill thought that the head coach was a, was a wonderful head coach, but he told them to get their butts back in practice. <laughs> and uh, we're seeing less and less in that. And, of course, mm -hmm. the worst situation is if, a uh, superintendent or athletic director believes their own kids should be playing and, and then intervenes. And uh, Lord have mercy if that happens. But uh, uh, eventually things got really good at Papillion La Vista South when the Rolfson twins and Kelly Hunter showed up. Um, not many high school coaches get to coach three women who go on to be Division I All-Americans who could play internationally. Uh, but that had to be tough in some ways. Uh, you know, the, I don't know the details, but I've heard stories that, uh, you know, the Rolfsons committed to Nebraska probably n not long after they were weaned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they were very talented, very skilled. Uh, it seemed like they had their own universe. Uh, you know, they had their world and then the world outside them, tremendously gifted. What kind of challenge did that present for you? Oh, it, it was a big challenge to make <laughs> things to make things fresh, you know, every year for them, because, you know, we're going to they're going to be up with me for four years. So I had to be pretty creative and to try and not make it dull, to make it challenging and you know, as an alum at Nebraska, I wanted to see, you know, we were kind of in a drought of national championships. We hadn't won one in a little while. And I was like, man, I want these guys to be tough and skilled. And I want them to step in there and hopefully we can win more than one while they're there or be close. So that was a challenge for me uh, to try and come up with things every day that they were in season with me that were challenging and that pushed them. And, you know, I, and especially, you know, trying to find opponents. So what I did a lot of is, you know, we overtrained at times so that they had to play when they were really tired. So that it made it more equal for the opponents. I don't know that we ever played fresh until we got to the state tournament. Wow. That's a, that's an interesting concept. Um, and K Kelly Hunter was the center on those teams. I'm, I'm, ha I'm thinking per perhaps, maybe until her senior year, she had to be intimidated a little bit by the, by the Rolfsons, or was that not the case? I don't know that she was ever intimidated. It was just, uh, you know, always a challenge to try to fit in with both of them because you got to remember when, when you have twins like that, they're each other's best friend. So to let somebody else in there to into their world is, is really hard. Right. And to her credit, uh, she never really tried to do that. She just tried to make her impression in her own way. Right. And that's the great thing about Kelly is she kind of is really adaptable to whatever group that she's around and kids are drawn to her uh, right. because she has such a great personality. Right. Beyond high school, you and Jake Moore started uh, Nebraska juniors and it, um, it's a little different type of club. It's kind of a throwback club. 
uh, in that it, it, it uh, when I was coaching and certainly even when the Rolfsons were there, it wasn't a club that had three or four teams in every age group. Uh, you, you had a certain, a few number of teams. You had elite players who came from across the state. Players like Angie Oxley and Kim Behrens traveled four or five hours to get across the state to, to train and, yeah. and compete. Um, but the thing I liked about it the most and the thing I liked about much of, uh, of club ball in Nebraska is that they were high school coaches involved. And so they understood that these women were also playing other sports. Uh, they understood, uh, you know, they, they'd had courses in ed psych. Um, their, their primary motive was not creating profit or, or keeping those kids in the gym as long as possible. Uh, I, I just thought it was a very healthy uh, situation. Uh, it also allowed you to train some pretty uh, in, incredible players, including uh, one from Hupper, Nebraska, uh, Jordan Larson, but talk about the philosophy of Nebraska juniors and and uh, what you and Jake uh, created. Well, it wasn't really me that created it. It was Jake. Jake took it over from somebody else, and I can't tell you who that was, but I started with um, sports courts. Remember coaching your daughter? Right. That, and, that was, yeah. Yep, in 95, and I like the philosophy of – his club and we had been hanging out during that club year when I first got back in it. And I was like, well, can I come coach in your club? And he said, sure. So I started coaching in that club to coach the top team and he ran the club. Hmm. And I liked the philosophy of, you know, we had at that time we had one, most of the time, one team per age level or maybe two. And the age different, the age levels were different. It was 18, basically it was 18, 16s, and 14s. There was no 12s at that time. And um, our philosophy was to get the best kids in Nebraska that we could get. And we practiced one day a week, usually on Sundays. And then we played and we played one time a month because every kid we had was playing another sport. And you won a, and you won a national championship practicing one day a week, mm -hmm. playing against teams that sometimes have the kids in the gym five days a week Yep, and not yep. allowing them to play other sports. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We did to, that. To, to me, that was a much, um, a much healthier uh, approach to, to club volleyball. Uh, you grew up at a time where there was a core group of coaches throughout the state that were involved in club volleyball. Certainly, uh, several in Omaha, several in Lincoln, uh, several out state. Is that still happening or is club volleyball um, more a, a, a corporate enterprise today? I would say it definitely is a more corporate enterprise. Every coach that we had uh, when I was coaching for most of them, I would say over 80 percent of every team that we had. And it's still like that today. Our club has mostly high school coaches or former high school coaches that are coaching teams. And then we have former players that are, we call them Rover coaches that kind of help those people. So that's still that way today. Uh, it's a really nice philosophy because we support them playing other sports. We're not pushing them to not do those sports. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it still stays that way. I, I can't say that about other clubs. Other clubs are not, don't have high school coaches. They have, you know, club, they're strictly club coaches. It's a business. You know, the more numbers they have and the more tournaments they play in, they generate more income. And it's a way that they make their living. So if you don't have kids in the gym, you're not making a living. I'm not. And, I and possibly paying the bills for a large facility. Absolutely. They're trying to, yeah, they're trying to pay off their facilities so that they can keep going. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of things that suffer because of that, you know, the technical part of it, you let kids get away with stuff that you normally wouldn't get away from, you know, the work ethic of working hard, you're not probably going to push them in the same way that we will. We don't, we don't have to worry if this is our income because every one of our coaches has another job. So we push a little bit harder, uh, talk to them a little more about expectations. You know, if you want to play at the college level, here's the expectations 
this is something that you have to do on a daily basis. It's, it's an everyday thing. You have to work hard every day. You have to be at your top level. You want to technically be at a high level. And I don't know that they're doing it at that, at that level as far as club. When you have a corporate thing, you just want bodies. You want people in your club. Well, you know, one of the things John Cook has proposed to the chancellor at the University of Nebraska is that Nebraska have a coaching curriculum. And um, he believes, and I think I believe, uh, that um, that there's um, coaching is, le- is, is kind of like that iceberg thing. W- what you see and what it actually is are, are quite a little bit different, that there's so many things in coaching. When, when people enter coaching, uh, what don't they understand? What, what's, what are some of the things that they don't understand they're going to have to do or the challenges that they're going to have that go beyond training a team for an hour and a half to two hours a day? Well, the things that are beyond that are, you know, you have to make sure that the buses, the travel is, you know, scheduled and, you know, make sure that you figure out what time you need to be there and how long it's going to take. Uh, uniform, ordering uniforms. You know, what, what do we have? What do we have for volleyballs? What other equipment do we have? Do we need more stuff? Do we need different things? How to plan out a practice? You know, how are we going to be organized with that? I mean, there's, I mean, Susie has, you know, is a diabetic. How are we going to arrange practice so that she can make it through a practice? Um, So-and-so has to leave because they have a night class or they're going to be late because they have this meeting after school. How are we going to adjust practice for that? I mean, there's, I mean, I could give you scenario after scenario of things that you have to be able to adjust to and understand and accommodate. And, you know, in the meantime, you want to put a, a, a team out there that can compete at as high a level as they can compete at and, and have a great experience. That's the whole thing is you want them to have a great experience. You want it to be something that they can remember, that they look back on, that they learned a lot, not only about volleyball, but about what kind of person they're going to be. You know, you're basically, you know, it's, it's a life, life skill type of job, teaching life skills. And, and you know, what I found um, is the relationship doesn't end when they leave. You know, you, you, you want them to contact you if they have other things to celebrate or other, other challenges. Um, w- without going into names, what, what was the most difficult situation you ever faced as a club or high school coach? Something that maybe you needed to go to somebody and say, hey, how, how do I handle this? Or, or you know, what are, what are our options here? Well, um, well, that's a tough one. You know, probably just the big thing is trying to develop team chemistry and get kids on the same page. That's, that's the biggest challenge, especially if, if one player does not like another player. Like they just don't like them. Like they come to you and say, I don't like her. <laughs> and that person, they both have to play on the floor together. So how am I going to get these people that don't like each other at all to play together? That's your biggest, that was my biggest challenge. And How do you approach that, Gwen? What are, what are your options? Well, um, the way I did it was I made sure that they were never partnered in any drill. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't get things going. And I tried to make sure that that one they weren't on the same side of the net as much as possible, so that the, the they didn't get irritated with each other. Tried to split them up more, and tried to sit down and individually with each of them and get them to understand the good things about each other, and that they needed to learn to get past the things that irritated them and that they didn't like for a period of time. Right. Uh, you know, the, the tendency is for coaches to say forever, uh, kids aren't like the kids like they used to be. Um, but I don't sense that's necessarily true with an exceptional coach. That my, my, I guess my, my initial response is they re, they'll do what you ask them to do, you know, if you're, if you're consistent. Uh, is, that, is that what you see? Absolutely. If you're, if you're consistent, 
and they know what they're getting every day, then they can they can adjust to okay this is this is how she's going to be okay we can we can adjust to that so I can make sure that if if she says that I need to put my hand on the ball better I better put my hand on the better because she's not going to let go of that until I do it mm-hmm. so they know that if they know that you can't be late then they're not going to be late <laughs> you know just those things once they know that you've set your standard but if you're if you're inconsistent with those they're going to take advantage. Or that's when things start to break down if you're not solid. And the other thing that helps you as a coach is the willingness to spend the extra time with them, helping them develop if that's what they want. If they come to you and say, hey, coach, I, I, can you spend 15 minutes with me on this? And you say yes every time, you never say no. That tells them something. Yeah, I, and I, I think you just talked about two or three of your strengths. You, you know, you've been consistent. You... Uh, you have a reputation for being an excellent trainer of individual fundamentals, but I think as important as that is that I never saw you lower your expectations for someone. And so sooner or later they come around. Uh, I always felt that uh, if someone had played uh, for Gwen Egbert, she could play at the university of Nebraska, that she already had seen those type of of expectations. Uh, Gwen, I think the the state owes you a lot uh, for, for what you've done for volleyball in the state of Nebraska. And I think Nebraska volleyball owes you a lot that the, the players that you've coached who've transitioned to Nebraska have certainly benefited from your input. I really appreciate you being a guest on Inside the Coaching Mind today. And and wish you well in the NIT with the University of Arizona. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. That's it for this episode of Inside the Coaching Mind with your host, Coach Terry Pettit. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, or just talking about it over a cup of coffee. All the ways to subscribe are posted on terrypettit.com. And don't forget to look for our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind with Terry Pettit. I'm Dave Young. We'll talk to you next time for the next episode of Inside the Coaching Mind.